In 1988, Veronique Le Guin, a French cave explorer, emerged from a cave in southern France after an astounding 111 days of solitary confinement. She set a new world record for the longest time a woman spent in isolation. Now, imagine her experience. She had to monitor herself daily using specialized instruments. Without access to a clock to monitor the time or music to help pass it, no sunrise or sunset, not even a change in the constant dank temperature of 48.1 degrees to indicate day or night. Returning to normal life, one might expect her to gradually recover. However, something was profoundly amiss with Veronique, a mystery even to her husband. Then, on January 27, 1990, something unthinkable happened. What exactly occurred during Veronique's experiment that so profoundly affected her? When we isolate ourselves for an extended period of time, deprived from all sorts of sensory stimulation and means to track time, what would happen to us? Such conditions are crucial to understand if we plan to send people into the far reaches of the solar system. For instance, a trip to Mars could involve about 7 months of travel, meaning a round trip with time spent on the planet might total around 18 months in a state of extreme isolation. Thanks to Michel Siff, a French scientist who stayed in a cave for 205 days back in 1961, found that, although he managed to adapt, he faced substantial challenges towards the end of the experiment mentally. Fast forward to 1988, the interest in further exploring human responses to such conditions resurfaced. This time, the focus shifted to examining how a female would adapt to similar conditions over a three-month period. If you're curious about how Michel Siff nearly lost his sanity and what groundbreaking discoveries he made about the human body, I highly recommend you watch my other video. In that one, I delve deeply into his experiences and findings. This video will focus more on what happened to Veronique, and you don't want to skip this because her story is very unsettling. So back to our story. Michel Siff was in search of a volunteer for his experiment, specifically seeking an experienced cave explorer. As it turned out, his friend's wife, Veronique Le Guin, was an ideal candidate. Veronique had an unconventional start to her married life. She and her husband, Francis, spent their first weekend as a married couple exploring an underwater cave near Paris. I hated my life. I felt I could do great things, but I didn't know what they would be, she reflected. The couple often invested any spare money they had from his photography business and her work as a temporary secretary into their cave exploration adventures. Meeting her husband, who is already an avid cave explorer, had transformed her life. Then, when Michelle Siff presented her with the opportunity to participate in a significant experiment, Veronique didn't hesitate to jump on the opportunity. On August 10, 1988, Veronique finally began her experiment, which, like Michelle Siff's, involved meticulous preparation. She was well equipped with food and all the necessary equipment for her stay. However, there were notable differences from Michelle's earlier experiment. One significant change was the use of cameras and microphones by the team above ground. This technology was primarily implemented as a safety measure to monitor Veronique's well-being, especially during prolonged period of silence, ensuring that the surface crew could confirm she was still alive. Another key difference was the absence of a music player. Music had been a crucial element in maintaining Michel Siff's sanity during his isolation. In contrast, Veronique's only source of entertainment was reading books. The perception of time underground can be strikingly different, lacking any natural indicators of day or night. For Veronique, this meant relying solely on her intuition to gauge the passage of time. Initially, for the first 15 days, her sleep-wake cycles remain relatively normal. However, they soon began to deviate significantly. Veronique had planned to use her menstrual cycles as a way to maintain a sense of time, but her judgment was increasingly impaired. For example, 
during what she perceived as one afternoon, she managed to read two entire books. In another instance, after preparing lunch, she decided to take a brief nap, only to find that she had slept for 18 hours. This pattern of distorted time perception grew more extreme, with her eventually staying awake for nearly 50 hours and sleeping for 30 hours at a time. The disorientation was very evident in Veronique's experience. Despite her intention to track time through her menstrual cycles, her skewed sense of time led her to believe that her periods were only 11 days apart. She reflected, if I had trusted my body, I would have been very close to the real time. Like Michelle, Veronique had a series of daily tasks to perform in order to track the changes in her body, and it's proven to be a significant struggle for her. She had to perform thousands of tests, including attaching and reattaching electronic sensors to her face and breasts, meticulously measuring and weighing her food, collecting urine samples for testing, and even conducting blood tests. The sheer volume of these tests was enormous. Even two years after the experiment, the data from the 15,000 tests she had conducted was still being analyzed. At one point, after oversleeping, Veronique failed to complete her daily tasks and Michelle called her and she was surprised to hear how furious he was because she had failed to connect the sensors that measure her vital signs. My anger was against the machines. My big problem was never loneliness. It was the quantity of scientific tests that had to be done as close together as possible. I deviated between feelings of guilt if I missed the test and responsibility and I became aggressively resentful. I feel a wave of immense aggressiveness that dominates my spirits. I struggle one after the other. I look at each of the instruments of my torture, equipment to take samples, analyze, count up, manipulate, pierce. A crazy desire overcame me to smash and destroy everything. As the experiment progressed, she was the one who was blowing up at Michelle because she thought he had been spying on her through a microphone installed in the cave, and this belief fueled her growing hostility towards him. Veronique perceived Michelle as the master who was torturing her from above, orchestrating the conditions that were causing her distress. She did a sketch of her cave that included a self-portrait, published with a series of articles that she wrote from underground for Figaro magazine in Paris, which showed her being strapped and laced with wires and probes. The sketch also showed a bookshelf where Michelle is the author of the books on sadomasochism. The most disturbing detail of her drawing is the dartboard on the wall. The target is now Michelle's face and he is covered in dart wounds. But as her resentment and hatred of her scientific master mounted, her affection for the cave and her books steadily increased. As time went by, her mentality started to adapt into something much more bizarre. She said, I do not feel changed by the experiment, but I do feel enriched in living memories and feelings. And there's one principle that was reinforced for me. While I was alone in my cave, I was my own judge. You are your own most severe judge. You must never lie or all is lost. The strongest sentiment I brought out of the cave is that in my life and all my future life, I will never tolerate lying. When Veronique received the message that her time underground had come to an end, she experienced a surge of affection for the cave that had been her home for so long. In a symbolic gesture of farewell, she placed candles around the interior of the cavern, illuminating its natural features. One last time, she wrote in her diary, I spoke to my stalagmites. I praised their bearings, their elegance. I didn't mention their age because, like Dorian Gray, they're not accessible to time. I thought, not without pangs of the heart, one of those furtive and lucid visions of life, that I would come back with white hair, my face wrinkled like an old apple. I would be with them again, these staunch companions of youth, still as bright and fine as they were today. Upon emerging from the cave, 
Veronica expected that she was finally going to break out of this rut she was in, but strangely, she was instead swept by a sense of regret. Despite resuming her normal life, she occasionally appeared disappointingly detached from the world above ground. This reaction was unexpected, especially considering her earlier description of the expedition as torturous. The passionate cave explorer who had eagerly volunteered for the experiment seemed to have undergone a profound transformation. Worse, something inside her was gone. Because a week later after her experiment, sitting and talking with a reporter, Veronic was considerably, visibly less emotional and frankly surprised by the before and after sameness of everything up here. When I was in the cave, I was afraid of what would happen when I finally saw people again. To my surprise, I discovered that the return was not at all difficult. I was gone for months, but now I feel as though I was only away for one week. And then, two years later, she was found dead in her car in northeastern Paris due to an overdose in barbiturate. Of course, Francis, Veronique's husband, was beyond heartbroken. And judging from the article that I read, it seems that there's a rift between him and his friend, Michelle. Michelle wanted to sweep everything under the rug, saying that the incident does not have any relation to her expedition. It was just purely private reasons. But Francis argues otherwise. According to her husband, he too couldn't understand what problem she was facing. He said she had had an emptiness inside her which she was unable to communicate. 